Hi, Misha here, and this is part two in an overview look at standard issue small arms of Deutschland of Germany, and that will go and this has and will continue through many phases in that nation's history from the uh, the Kaiser era through the Weimar through of course Nazi through post Cold War with West and East Germany. And of course, reunification and through present day. Yeah, they've gone through a lot of changes. In part one, we looked at the first smokeless powder, the commission rifle, and then probably the single most influential bolt action design of the late 19th, early 20th century, the Mauser Model 98. And then of course its derivatives the K98A, K98B, and then of course the final version, the K98K. And that's where we left off. So in part two, we'll start off with the uh, earliest attempts at self-loader. This is the Walther G41, formerly known as the G41W. This was a self-loading loading rifle only. Of course, the next one you probably know even better. The G43. While these were not revolutionary, the next gun, the MP43, MP44, STG44, certainly was. If the Model 98 Mauser was a revolutionary bolt action, this is just a revolutionary firearm. It changed warfare. It changed what the average soldier boots on the ground would carry it really combined the range accuracy at least as much as was needed of the bolt action with the rapid fire of a submachine gun and honestly that's why the landscape would change in the 50s and 60s but of course germany was split up so in the west they would have at first the g1 we have my FAL G1 build on a Kuhn, on, excuse me, on a um, DSA receiver, and then that would be followed by the G3, which would uh, mine here is a Springfield SAR, and then of course we have another build, an East German MPI KM. I'll tell you right now, I don't have any other East German AKs because, well, there were no imports and parts kits be expensive. And if I'm going to spend that kind of money, I'd rather have this last gun, my uh, G36, which is the one I got from Mike Ott. I know some people have said Otty. The problem for me is I grew up with a family called Ott, spelled the same way, and they pronounced it Ott. So you can't break a lifetime of habit, plus that's how my speech says it. So, hey, the little computer voice in my head says that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is uh, one of the few he did, and uh, really great is a G36. So, yeah, let's just, uh, you know, pick back up where we left off with part one. Germany's first self-loading general issue rifle was this guy here, the Walther. Gewehr 41. As I said in part one with the K98s, there was debate about if the new rifle in 1934 should be a bolt action or a self loader. What they ended up deciding to go with was the MG34 machine gun essentially escorted, protected by bolt actions. And so, while minor work had been done in the 1930s, what really gave them a kick in the pants, Germany had been lagging behind, was encountering the SVT Tokarev in Russia in 1941, during Operation Barbarossa, and afterwards. They saw how effective it was. Kind of ironically, the Germans seemed to like the SVT more than the Russians. So with this, the German army put pressure to get something similar. 
and the two companies that were at the forefront were Mauser and Walther. And this led to two kind of pre-production guns, the G41M and the G41W. Now, the military had some pretty restrictive and honestly unrealistic qualifications and in, in needs. They it needed to be able to fire 8mm, same as the Car 98, be as accurate as the Car 98. It needed to have no external moving parts. It needed to be able to operate as a bolt action if it jammed up or just when needed. And they didn't want a hole in the barrel, so no gas port. Mauser fulfilled these requirements to a T with their M model. He did everything including no external parts and uh, being able to be used as a bolt action. It's mechanically very interesting and also incredibly impractical. They would build about 7,000 of them. Most would be sent to the Eastern Front. A large number were actually sent back because they weren't working. It was so complicated and fidgety. It just didn't uh, didn't work at all. Walther's design, the W, did adhere to the no gas port thing. Hence they used the bang gas trap system in the front here, which is why it's so thick. But when it came time for the no external moving parts, they just conveniently ignored it. So they left a moving bolt handle on the top here. Which they said, okay, there's your bolt action accessibility. So by not strictly adhering to the requirements, they actually delivered maybe not the gun that the German military thought they wanted, but the one they needed. And in 1942, the G41W was selected for adoption and further refinement, becoming just the G41, Gewehr 41. And, uh... These would be produced, of course, at Walther, but also at BLM, so two factories. And no one really knows how many they made. Estimates are wildly inconclusive, anywhere from 40,000 to nearly 150,000. We just don't know because so many were sent again to the Eastern Front where they were promptly lost. So, yeah. What exactly do we have here? She is a little bit longer than the Mauser K98 at 45 inches, mostly because of this gas trap system. However, she has a shorter barrel at 21 and a half inches. And because of being a self-loader, she's pretty heavy at 11 pounds. She feeds from a fixed double stack 10 round mag that is topped off with uh, stripper clips. Has a wing type safety in the rear. It has a lot of Mauser features otherwise. It takes a Mauser sling, Mauser style solid cupped butt plate. Pretty traditional sights. Takes a Mauser style cleaning rod. Has a long upper handguard. This one here is actually made of a synthetic material like Durafall. Kind of neat because it's a BLM. And so this would be their first self-loading rifle. Soldiers liked it for, well, being self-loading. But the bang system required a lot of maintenance, and it was long and heavy. Therefore, really, it was only in main production until 1943. The earliest prototype Gewehr 43s would appear and be handed off to the German army in January and February of 1943. And really all they did, they took the short stroke gas piston from the SVT Tokarev and installed it and removed the bang system. 
the um, G43 still retained a 21 and a half inch barrel and its overall length wasn't much shorter it's about 44 and a half inches but the gas system switch had other benefits it was about 9.6 to 9.7 pounds so over a pound lighter also far less bulky in the front much less susceptible to fouling and dirt it didn't require near as frequent cleaning and it was very quickly appreciated and ordered into production. They ordered that uh, G41 production was to end and replaced by the G43. At this point they didn't care the fact that it had a gas port, a hole in the barrel. They realized this was silly. It would of course take time to tool up. So BLM would continue making G41s in 1943. Walther would start producing the new rifle at least full production that fall. They would build about 3,200 that year, but virtually none would actually make it to the front lines before Christmas. In 1944, BLM would switch over, and a third factory would come online with the code BCD, which was Guslav Work, which was a concentration camp. While these are collectible today, it's because of their rarity. The camp only produced a handful before being bombed and production was shutting down. So the two main makers were BLM and Walther, with BLM kind of considered to be the higher quality, the more consistent one. So by 1944, say mid year, these started to appear in the field in large numbers, so right around or maybe right after D-Day. And they were in common use by the time of the Battle of the Bulge. Still firing 8mm, now we have the attaching 10 round mag, it can still be topped off by clips though. They made some changes to speed up and ease production. For example, they went from a traditional milled machine receiver to a new forged receiver, some of them being called rough forgings. They also went from screwing the barrel in to using press and pinning methods. And actually BLM even pioneered use of cold hammer forge barrel technology to even further speed things up. Stocks could be laminate or walnut. And there are a lot of production changes, some of them to simplify and speed things up, others to try to improve the design. And uh, while production ended, of course, with the G41, several guns would remain in service, again, especially on the Eastern Front, until 1945. But it was clear at this point this was a dead-end system. It was just too conservative, a fixed magazine. The reason they did that, they were worried that a self-loading rifle would cause a soldier to waste ammo, the common argument of the day. But by the G43, the detaching mag was common and they usually issued them with two spare mags. Those of you that follow the channel know my two G43s. Actually the lower one is a K43. In uh, April, May, the higher-ups ordered that the name go from Gewehr 43, so Rifle 43, to Carabiner 43. It was just a political thing. And it would actually take quite a while for it to be implemented. It wasn't until that fall or even winter that the factories would get over to remarking them. And even then some G43 marked receivers would appear in 1945. And there would even be some that would be double marked. Ice cream again. <laughs> And like I said, they would make several productions. You know the difference. You know, they went from a ribbed to a flat butt plate. They went from a milled dust cover with, excuse me, milled top cover with automatic dust cover to a stamped top cover with manual dust cover. The scope rail was supposed to be a standard feature and really did appear on most 
but they only actually made about 53,000 true issued with the scope snipers during World War II. It was uh, just not really a great sniper platform. It didn't have the accuracy. Typical sights, again, receiver stylings would change over time. Stocks would be walnut or laminate. They would uh, start off with a threaded barrel and then stop threading it. I always seem to have a cleaning rod though. And the barrel profile would be simplified. Interestingly, by 1944, some were in favor of halting K98 production altogether and going straight over to the G43. It was felt not only to be a better battlefield gun, but uh, some claimed it, it cost the same or even less money to make than the traditional Car 98. The G43 used more modern manufacturing techniques, used more stamped parts, used more forgings versus traditional milling. And then as the war went on, they found ways to make further economies. But of course, this never happened. They kept the Mazarin production to the end of the war. Flipping over, we can see the solid caulking handle that was originally used with the bolt catch, bolt hold open, which also assisted in disassembly. Later, they would go quite early on actually to a hollow bolt handle. And then Walther, BLM would never do it, but Walther would remove the uh, to catch assembly, which facilitated some internal changes. They would also move the recoil lug a bit. They would go to a dual uh, guide lug in some late ones to try to improve accuracy. And uh, Walther would tinker with the gas system to try to get better reliability. But in the end, they really just ensured reliability by overgassing the hell out of it. Which long term use could lead to cracked receivers and also this safety that's not terribly well held in to begin with could pop off. This is why shooters today, if they have GK43s, will purchase gas system adjustable gas kits for theirs so they don't put undue wear. And it's not one of those theoretical things. There are plenty of pictures out there of uh, GK43s with cracked receivers. And the British found this too during post-World War II testing. Nevertheless, production would continue at the two factories. Walther would end in April of 1945 when they were captured. BLM would continue until May, until the end of the war. And all told, they would produce a little over 402,000. So not a small number, but far fewer than the Mauser, and not enough to really make a difference. Plus, there and again, this is only a self-loading rifle with a 10 round mag and it is firing a full power cartridge and it was a design made in very much rushed wartime conditions so it never really was 100% perfected and that showed so post-war use was pretty limited the East German police would reissue them West Germany would use them in limited numbers in the late 40s Czechoslovakia would adopt it as an interim solution until their VZ-52 was online, calling it the VZ-43. And of all places, Brazil would try making a copy in 30-06, but aside from a small production run, this never went much of anywhere. And like with the K-98, the Russians captured a boatload of these and uh, refurbished them after the war. And they're still in storage in Russia today because the Russians want way too much money for them, at least that's what the importers say. So there is a cache of G-43s over there. But all in all, this was pretty much a dead end. But Germany's next rifle was anything but. Hobo, our old reliable cat that kind of keeps an eye on everything that goes on in the house. She's not very aggressive or violent, but she sure keeps an eye on things and kind of tells everyone else what to do. Not since Paul Mauser 
it introduced the world to the model 98 the Gewehr 98 had Germany had such a revolutionary firearm the machine pistol 44 or the storm rifle 44 this wasn't just revolutionary this wasn't just ahead of the curve this set the curve and it left all other nations pretty much playing catch-up for the next decade and it very nearly didn't happen with the K-43 Germany was pretty behind I mean it was a self-loading rifle true not all nations had self-loading rifles in World War II for example Britain but most had something America Russia even France and Sweden and this was not a particularly good gun because it was rushed not a particularly horrid but not great but the MP44 really would have benefited Germany if it had been introduced earlier as opposed to being delayed and kind of shoved off and a lot of that had to do with politics the Nazi German regime at the top was rife with with politics the idea for this really dated back to the end of World War One Germany had the machine pistol 18 one of the world's first submachine guns with the idea to have kind of a rifle submachine gun crossover dated back to then in the 1930s there were kind of test programs but they were given low priority finally they would develop the 8 millimeter curves the 9 excuse me the 7.92 by 33 cartridge and after this they would start kind of asking companies to develop a rifle to fire it it basically needed to have at least 400 meters range needed to be not any heavier or longer than the car 98 they needed it to launch grenades amount of bayonet amount of scope perhaps all kinds of stuff and of course be select fire the two contenders ended up being Hanel with its MKB42H prototype and Walther with its MKB42W prototype and as we know the Hanel was selected the MKB42 would evolve into the MP431 and then this would just turn into the MP43 over these changes they would go from an open bolt to a closed and they would eventually delete the bayonet lug seeing it as unnecessary also, also often the scope mount will go away and as is famously known at first Hitler was opposed to it he was first shown prototypes in 42 was unimpressed found out about, again, found out about them again in 43 and while he could have completely quashed the project he allowed it to continue only as a research program so while he was not in favor obviously he did not right hate it however by the end of 1943 after convincing by many around him his attitude changed he ordered it into production wanting a crazy high number built per month because it's Hitler the MP44 would be the same gun but uh, with a few minor updates and tweaks and then of course this is famously known it would be changed to the STG STG 44 storm rifle 44 translating to assault rifle for propaganda reasons many credit Hitler with this he might have said it but others say that actually Goebbels came up with the name regardless it started to be used but yeah you don't really know and some guns are even marked MP45 in 1945 and these would be produced, of course, by Hanel. This one here is made by Steyr. Early ones would be blued, later would have phosphate. And, um, yeah, it was Select Fire, 30-round box magazine. Kind of heavy, 
a little over 10 pounds but only 37 inches long with a 16 and a quarter barrel the barrel was threaded as well it does have a stacking rod hooded front sight uh, sheet metal handguard left side charging reciprocating handle fire selector is uh, separate from the safety here's our safety selector thumb located our fire mode is here they could have wood or bakelite pistol grips wood buttstock with a small storage compartment vertically because it has a kind of submachine gun style long spring inside the receiver is actually stamped folded and welded steel spot welded these were actually quite inexpensive to produce operated using a long stroke gas piston and a tilting or tipping bolt pretty standard iron sights But it still had a little bit kind of in common, at least control-wise, with the uh, Gewehr K43. And it was not actually adopted to replace the Gewehr, or even the Car 98. It was actually adopted to supplement existing guns. Flipping it over. Notice it has a takedown pin here spring loaded catch on it we have a port door dust cover the housing on the lower is stamped the trigger is actually very similar to that in the uh, K43 as well so there are definitely some common kind of Germanic elements here threaded muzzle and they managed to crank out around 425,000 before the war ended. Pretty significant considering how late it went into production. They first appeared in the field in October of 1943 and then were used en masse in 1944 and 1945, especially again on the Eastern Front because this allowed one man to tie up a significant number of Russians as long as he had ammo and that ultimately became the big kind of bottleneck yeah they can make the guns but did they have enough magazines did they have enough eight millimeter Kurs ammo which to be fair was one of Hitler's legitimate concerns about the MP44 and another reason they held back putting these into the field in large numbers is they didn't want to just deploy them 500 here 500 there they wanted to kind of deploy them en masse and to be fair, it, it did delay the Russians. And it really developed a lot of the tactics that would appear in later assault rifles. And have a lot of the characteristics we would think of. I mean, 30 round detaching mag, stamped receiver, of course select fire, the 16 and a quarter inch barrel that's so ubiquitous with so many models. Yeah. Recently, we have actually done a video on this gun, giving quite a bit of history, so I'm not going to harp on too long about it here. But, I will compare it with all the Cold War guns. So, whereas the K-43 pretty much ended, the MP-44 would influence a lot. And, and even the existing German guns, they would be used briefly in West Germany after the war. The uh, East Germans would use them from around 49 up until the early 60s. Czechoslovakia would adopt these, as would Yugoslavia. And of course, Russia captured a large number. And they still pop up even in the 21st century in certain hot spots in, for example, Africa. So they, they were actually quite durable. They didn't have a lot of the issues like the K-43. So, World War II is over, and now it's the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact 
versus the US, Britain, and NATO. And of course, Germany herself is split right down the center, west and east. So with the end of the Nazi regime, we're going to, of course, have a break in firearms production for a while. And up until this point, I've shown you original guns, just unaltered original guns. But of course, post-war, everything starts to go select fire. So our remaining guns will all be variants and stuff. So you'll have to just understand that. I, it would be great to have an original G1, but they don't exist. But this is a very... DSA has always made good guns, and this was put together by, well, skilled friend. And then, of course, with the uh, SAR-3, I need to do an update video. We've talked about this one, but I really like this gun. In some ways, I like it better than HK-91. Heresy, I know. <laughs> and this was put together for me by my friend at Mac Arms, MK Arms there. Yeah. So with that, we will continue. Of course, immediately after World War II, Germany was an occupied nation. It was split amongst four powers, U.S., Russia, Britain, and France. With, of course, uh, the U.S., France, and Britain pretty much having West Germany and Russia having East. The only weapons that were allowed were for police use. And then they started letting them have some old World War II era guns, including the Stungewehr. It wasn't until the 1950s that restrictions started to lessen as the Cold War started to heat up. I and mean, we will get to East Germany. But we'll start with West Germany. And they restarted their rifle naming convention here with the Gewehr 1 which is an FAL not produced in West Germany but made per their specifications. Mag pouch. This of course fires 7.62 NATO 308 and is a select fire battle rifle. That said, you can still clearly see a lot of elements of the STG-44. We still have a wood stock. Quite similar pistol grip. The safety is in a very similar location. Both have metal handguards. It's kind of a coincidence, but they do. But of course the FAL, the G1, is much larger. It's got a 20, 21 inch barrel. And, uh, yeah, if I was a much more powerful round. The story in, in West Germany begins actually with the West German Border Guard, the BGS. In 1955, they ordered a little over a hundred so-called Canada models. So wood furniture, no bipod, no flash hider, a few minor improvements. And then they were satisfied with these, the second order was 2,000 units and they started to integrate a few changes including an early Type B style flash hider and slightly updated furniture and then they would place another order for 4,800 slowly evolving into the BGS FAL we, we kind of think of with the metal handguards and bipod they had a T48 style or Type B style birdcage flash hider not like this is not one, but kind of similar profile. But these early BGS guns still had the tall front sights. And again, they were all made by FN in Belgium. But the, uh, the Bundeswehr was also needing a new rifle. The old guns were getting clapped out. And so they began talks in 1955 with the, the main deliveries for what was designated as the G1 in 1957 and 1958. And the G1 is what we have here. This is a kit gun 
on a DSA forged receiver, type 1 receiver. The major difference is this was the first model to introduce the uh, short sights. They're 3 millimeters shorter. Has your typical folding carry handle. Hand guards, folding bipod. And they had a very unique flash hider. This is actually quick detachable. You just twist about a quarter turn and it pops off. It's on a lug that looks like a bayonet lug. And this allowed them to quickly snap on a grenade launcher or a blank fire device or what have you. And this does look similar to an STG-58, but there are differences. The STG-58 came out later, so it had a further evolved bipod, a little made better, things like that. In total, it's estimated that the border guards might have had as many as 30,000 rifles, although some might have been maybe ex-Army G1s, and the Army had ordered 100,000 from FN Belgium. And there's a lot of famous stories about <laughs> why these were not produced in West Germany. And as usual, flipping everything over. Not a whole lot different to see. This is the early metal charging handle. Kind of honestly in the same position as you would find on a Sturmgewehr, but it's non reciprocating now. Like I said, the safety selector is now one unit as opposed to two. But it's in a very similar kind of thumb position. I'm not at all saying the FAL is a STG-44 clone. Of course it's not. In fact, FN had some very early work on this done before World War II. But then the Germans invaded. And that's why they would not let the Germans... Uh, produce these. They were happy to sell them guns where they had control over them and Germany would make some spare parts and small parts including HK making some but uh, no they were not going to grant a license which is kind of funny because the other attitude FN took to any of the allies who helped liberate them they gave the FAO free of charge or at least they didn't ch you know they, they, they charged the material but they didn't charge them for the, the intellectual property. So where as nations like Britain and Canada would receive it for free, <laughs> Germany certainly had to pay for the G1. And to be fair, the Germans weren't stupid. They knew it wasn't going to fly, but they had to kind of play the political game. They of course had an alternative already waiting in the wings. But the G1 did serve for a brief time in the Bundeswehr and was post-war Germany's first standard issue rifle and with over a hundred thousand and certainly a respectable number for peacetime most were out of service by the mid to late sixties and were sold off a lot of them going to Turkey who had previously acquired quite a few of their old Mausers so with this, just a footnote in history, we come to really what West Germany really wanted. Nummy. Hello, Nummy. Such a wild cat. Would you believe she's like four years old? Yeah. There are a few modern rifles so synonymous with Germany or Heckler and Koch like the G3 and you would think it's maybe Germany's first new domestic design after World War II but as I'm sure most of you know this isn't 100% true in fact its lineage goes to Spain but there and again <clears throat> the Spanish gun, the Setme, model A and B their lineage goes to Germany again. So yeah. Like the uh, FAL, it fires a 7.62 NATO. But it does have a shorter barrel at about 17.7 inches. Call it 18 just for ease of sake. 
thanks to its construction it's quite a bit lighter at about nine pounds at least for the fixed polymer stock model and it has an overall length of about forty and a half inches so not a lot longer than the uh, STG 44 it is select fire but by standard fed from 20 round mags for steel later alloy to save on weight okay briefly the story as brief as I can be yeah end of World War II Germany specifically Mauser was experimenting with a way to make a cheap easy to mass produce yet still very reliable gun this was the STG 45M prototype and one thing they removed was the gas system. The STG44 has a sh long stroke, so kind of AK style gas piston. They got rid of it, and they managed to do this by doing a roller delayed blowback system, kind of inspired by the MG42. But they only built a few guns and had parts for a few more when the war was over. The designers that had been working on it kind of split up. Some went to France where they worked on prototypes that didn't go much of anywhere. Others, including Mr. Vor Grimler, went to Spain. And then a new company was set up in Spain to develop technology for their military because Franco and Hitler had been buddies. Hitler was gone, Franco was still in power. And so Vor Grimler went to work with a few other Mauser colleagues at SETME. And they worked on a new rifle using the delayed blowback principle. They first started working with just the 8mm Kurz round. Then they wanted a little more out of it, so they made it a little longer. It was a 7.9 by 40. Then they scaled that down a bit to be 7.62 by 40. And by the 1950s, they had what they called the Model 2, which the German Border Guard, West German Border Guard, and to be fair also, a little bit more further back, the Bundeswehr were interested in and they kind of helped it along and provided feedback and said they might be interested in, in purchasing it and so this led to the Model A. Now the Model A would fire 7.62 by 51 which should be the NATO round but it wasn't strong enough yet so they had a reduced power cartridge known as 7.62 Six to set me. Other delays and, and shortcomings, the the border guard gave up, and that's when they went to buy the FAL. And obviously, the uh, Bundeswehr did the same. However, HK, a new young company, kind of born out of the ashes of Mauser, worked with set me to improve the Model A. And in 57, the Spanish army would adopt the Model A as it was, but it was a limited production gun. But in 1958, they hit gold. They made the Model B. Now, as originally released, the Model B still fired 7.62 SEPMI. And it was adopted not only by the army now, but also the Spanish Air Force and Navy. But the Model B could with some changing around of parts and stronger springs and whatnot, fire 7.62 NATO. Coincidentally, relations between FN and Germany were breaking down, so trials were held to replace the G1. The SETME Model B, or SETME Model 1958, went up against the Armalite AR-10 and the Swiss STGW 57, or rather an earlier version, the AM55. But anyway, we've actually done a full-length video on those trials, so you can check that out. And as you know, the Model B set me was selected as the Bundeswehr's new G3 battle rifle. And the government would have rights on it, and they would assign production to two companies, HK, yes, but also Rheinmetall. It would actually not be until about a decade later that HK and Rheinmetall would negotiate where HK would get exclusive rights and HK would work with the government and then they would end up truly owning the design. But in, in, in the beginning they didn't. Although, to be fair, they helped design it. So your early G3s look very much like 
set me's. They had wood furniture, they had the early style sights, but unlike the set me Model B, from the outset the G3 was intended to fire 7.62 NATO. It is a roller delayed gun, so no gas system, and much like with the STG44, it has a vent and, and a welded receiver. Also has a very similar butt stock style with the push pin. This has two takedown pins, whereas the STG only has one, but yeah. And while this has the famous diopter sights now, original versions of the G3 actually had a sight much more like the uh, STG44. So yeah. Even the uh, selector control is very similar. So the, really the biggest difference was that the G3 fired a more powerful cartridge. And that gets into NATO politics that I am not even touching right now. So relatively lightweight, simple, reliable, this was a success. Not only did the German, West Germans purchase them, HK would have great luck exporting them all around the world. And that's where this model comes from. This is actually a Greek SAR-3-8 brought over by Springfield. It's one of the Cotton Customs guns. So it's a pre band that still has things like the removable flash header. I kind of like it because it has a phosphate finish. And it has the later furniture. And they would uh, improve the design in several important ways. This rifle here is a clone a Samato of a G3 A3, which was an update. Early on, they would go away from the original pattern of sights and original pattern of cocking tube and bayonet lug and going to what we know today. They would also change the flash rider a wee bit. And then they would go from the wood furniture to green synthetic for the military. Originally, they would have steel mags. But HK had been working on a disposable alloy mag. Well, the disposable part didn't really ever materialize, but they did end up developing and adopting the HK alloy mag in the late 60s that has proven a very good mag. Here you can see the selector is actually very similar location to the STG44. Just being a single control versus two. You know, a lot of people talk about how the AK ripped off the STG44, but to me, there's more MP44 Stungewehr in this thing. Maybe it's just because of how the receiver and everything is made. I don't know. And as you know, it's a highly modular design. The handguard's held on with a push pin. The uh, lower is held on with a push pin. It would in a military one, there'd be a paddle release there. And this would actually be West Germany's assault rifle, battle rifle, till the end of the Cold War. There were some attempts to replace it. For example, the G11. Later, the G41, which was an update to the HK33. But uh, none of this happened. So, after only having the G1 for a few years... They would end up issuing the G3 for over three decades. And of course they would have a lot of export customers as well. People love these things, so I brought it out. This is the collapsing stock as featured on the G3 A4. Or as it's better known, the meat tenderizer. <laughs> because of its butt plate style. This allowed the gun to be collapsed to about 33 inches and is easy to install with just the two pins. Already has its recoil spring. However, it does add weight. When this is on the gun, the G3A4, it's about 10 pounds. There's also a carbine version that the Bundeswehr and many others issued called the G3K4 usually which is essentially the same gun but with a shortened 12.4 inch barrel and a slightly shortened caulking tube and handguard to accommodate that. 
a little bit lighter, a little bit more handy. Kind of neat. And here's one more accessory for you. This is the wide, or is it sometimes called tropical handguard, with the removable HK type bipod. Just in case you need a bipod for fun times. Like I said, and as you know, I'm, I know you know this, but you know the handguard is quick removable, so you can easily replace the slim line with this and other types. It's by one reason, amongst many, that this uh, stayed in service for as long as it did. Simple and effective. Maybe not the best trigger, <laughs> but very easy to hand very good mags and semi-autos have been available in America for a very long time early in the 60's we had the G3 semi-auto and then that turned into the HK41 which turned into the HK91 and then there were a couple of kind of 90's post band versions like the HK911 and of course there's the SAR3, SAR8 from Springfield and the Portuguese G3 and X G3 and today companies like PTR do make high quality G3s too so its legacy is, is very well regarded and it's right up there with the FAL in my mind I still prefer the FAL but if someone prefers the G3 I completely understand both very good 308 caliber guns and with that, we've seen what West Germany was doing during the Cold War. But what about a little further to the east? Life in East Germany, the DDR, was quite different from life in West Germany, especially as time went on. The Soviet Union was pretty strict with all of its member client states, but East Germany in particular had a rough time of it. Like I said, they were using older guns including the STG-44 through the 40s and 50s. And then they would start producing under license the SKS. I don't have a East German SKS to show you because they are exceedingly rare one of those things. They're quite interesting. Very similar, but they don't store a cleaning kit in the buttstock. Instead they keep it in the pouch, which is actually just an update of the World War II kit. There's a few differences to the sling and whatnot as well, but it, it's pretty standard. A, fr a friend has one. It was a Vietnam bringback gun, and uh, it's pretty standard. Not identical though. And then in 1958, they started setting up for licensed production of the Soviet AK Type 3, AK-47. This would be the milled receiver, 762 by 39 And it would be adopted as the MPI-K, essentially Machine Pistol Kalashnikov. The first couple of years, production was slow. They also had some trouble getting their QC down right. They had some worker issues. So it wasn't until 1960 that the MPIK was in full production, full swing. And by this point, the quality had gone up dramatically. Had a very pretty blued finish, beech wood furniture. It again had a unique sling mount and did not have a cleaning rod under the barrel or a storage compartment in the stock for a cleaning kit. Again, relying on the type that would go in the side pocket of the pouch here that would continue to be used for quite a long time. And then in 1964 East Germany decided to switch production over to the stamped AKM and would transition some early production guns would appear in 65 but full production doesn't seem to have started until 1966 and they would produce them for a very long time. After they met the needs of their own military, they would produce them for commercial, well, you know, military export 
all the way up until the end of the Cold War, around 1989-1990. And oftentimes, the Soviets would use East Germany as their client <coughs> puppet state to sell guns to people that they couldn't or shouldn't sell to directly. Now, the MPIKM, as it was known, is very similar to an AKM. Early guns had beechwood furniture, but soon it was changed to this black plastic, I mean black, this brown plastics free, unique hollow buttstock, no storage compartment inside for a cleaning anything, just a metal butt plate. Has a small sling swivel on the bottom for this one inch sling, but on the other hand, a good way to tell real quick in East German is the front loop will be wider because they didn't use the typical AK hook. They did try using a plastic lower briefly in the 60s but it wasn't heat resistant enough so they went back to the beech wood for the lower handguard and this would remain until around 1980 when they would start using a Bakelite handguard with kind of a ribbed section here for grasping. They would have standard mags typically with a blued finish and the guns would be blued for quite some time but they would switch over to kind of a really even gray black paint or really fine phosphating in the 80s otherwise it's it's standard AKM uh, 16 and a quarter inch lightweight barrel standard bayonet lug uh, early would have muzzle nuts Later they would go to muzzle brakes, AKM style. So really the, the deal with these, this is of course a kit build. There are no semi-auto East German imports. They're mostly respected for being rare and for just having very nice fit and finish. They're very well machined. So after an initial rocky start, soon the DDR would be known for producing some of the best looking AKs. I would say the only other nation to really challenge them there might be Poland because they also made some really pretty ones. This is a pretty standard mag pouch. Pretty unique. It's a very water resistant material. Holds four 30 round mags. There are a few versions. There's a straight version, a curved version, and they have versions with and without the side pocket for uh, kit and just this under belt loops you know the deal they're neat they're neat pouches and they're very flexible though for lots of reasons now a lot of people and I, there's a whole video I'm not going to talk more than a second on it but the STG44 having the AK as a copy of it I really don't think so I've said that in videos as we've looked at the FAL and the G3 they have plenty of features that the STG-44 does as well. And yes, the AK and STG share features. But actually, if you look at the early AK-46, it has far less in common with the STG-44 than it does other Soviet guns like the Tokarev and SKS. My point is just that the, the STG-44 influenced all assault rifles, all battle rifles, regardless. And the AK is no exception. They would make variants, of course. One of the most famous would be the MPI KMS 72, which was the same gun, but with the now pretty famous kind of fire poker wire stock, the single strut stock that comes back and makes a loop. That was actually developed by East Germany. And then later it was copied by Egypt and Romania and Poland. So, and with the benefit of it, even though it wasn't quite as compact as some others, you could use the same rear trunnion, the same receiver, for a fixed or a folder. Also, one thing to note, this is one of the lightest AKM variants, thanks to the synthetic buttstock. So that's one thing in its favor, it's a lightweight gun. 
These are known for having nice high quality barrels. But again, the only way to get one in the U.S. is to just get a kit and build it on a U.S. receiver. Or I guess do a receiver reweld. But unfortunately, most kits that have come in don't have the original barrel. Well, East Germany would be one of the nations that would produce 5.45 guns. They made the MPI M74 series, which was 5.45 by 39. And it looks pretty much like a Bulgarian or a Russian AK-74. But most of those, at least that I'm aware of, had the wire poker side folding stock. They also did a short carbine version for a brief, brief period from around 1986-87 known as the MPI M74K. But uh, I don't have one of the uh, 545s. Would I like one? Sure. But the kits without barrel were $800 and uh, nah. I just didn't want one that badly and yeah. It would be neat but you can't have them all. And uh, they're, like I said, very similar to other other production AK-74s. They even tried doing a 223 version late. That's actually where the whole STG-90 and STG-2000C, all the IO guns, kind of originate from. It was an export idea, but it never really got off the ground because of the end of communism. And uh, all these guns, 762 and 545, would remain in service until the Berlin Wall would come down. And then, after 45 years, the two halves would be reunited again. And so would their firearms. And we conclude this video with the first service rifle to be adopted by a unified Germany since World War II. The Heckler & Koch Gewehr 36 G36. And this is the standard model, sometimes G36E, with full length barrel. Standard folding stock. Very modular gun, though. So, yeah. In the 1970s, HK was selling the HK-33 in 5.56 to foreign customers. But the, uh, the Bundeswehr, while they wanted a replacement for the G3, really wanted something revolutionary. And this is where the G11 comes into the scene in the 1980s. This was to fire a brand new 4.7 millimeter caseless round and just be a, a quantum leap ahead. But R&D drug out and the gun suffered from honestly just some intrinsic problems with caseless. Money and time kept getting dumped into it. But then when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, two things happened at the same time. One, West Germany no longer had a threat next door. Two, they were taking on East Germany, which was, frankly, an economic burden. Uh, West Germany was in a lot better economic financial condition than East Germany at the time. So with that, the military's budget was severely cut by 1990, and this was a problem for HK because they had a lot riding on the G11. Sensing that the military just could not afford to buy all new G11s, they originally suggested that they just buy enough G11s for the frontline units, and then purchase what they called the G41 for second line reserve units. And the G41 was a slightly updated 
HK-33 that took Stanag mags and had a few other little bells and whistles like a dust port and cover and everything like that. Uh, this didn't seem like a good idea to the Bundeswehr because it meant they would have two main cartridges, 4.7 and 5.56, in the supply chain. The G-11 was still expensive, and the G-41 was not really that much better than the G3 they had. So when that didn't work, HK approached them and said, okay, how about just buying G41s? And again, the Bundeswehr didn't, no. It wasn't enough of a jump forward. They had abandoned the notion of a revolutionary step forward, but they still wanted an evolutionary step forward. Well, this put HK in a really bad position, and this is actually how they ended up declaring bankruptcy and being acquired by British Aerospace. Finally in 1992 the Bundeswehr uh, released requirements for what they wanted. It needed to be cheaper to build, purchase, and also operate than the G3. It needed to be lighter. It needed to be more modular. It needed to be chambered for an existing cartridge, so no 4.7. And while they didn't specify it needed to be chambered for 5.56 explicitly, they did have in the terms that it needed to be more controllable on full auto than the G3, which basically was saying 5.56 without just I write saying it. Also, they wanted it to be ambidextrous, which was something different. And they wanted it to be modular so that the same basic receiver could be reworked for different roles and finally they wanted it to be essentially a conventional design conventional layout and they specified uh, you know probably probably no bull pops and with these requirements in hand HK got to work on the HK 50 project and in 1995 the prototypes were tested up against guns such as the Steyr AUG and then they were pretty much selected in 1996 for German issuance. In 1997, the HK-50 would be renamed the G-36. An initial order for 50,033 and then with an option for 17,000 more would be placed. And the first ones would be given to units for advanced field testing late summer of 1997. And the first time they would be used in a combat zone would come soon in Kosovo in 1999. So, with that, what exactly did uh, Unified Germany come up with? I'm sure most of you know it, but let's hit the highlights of this neat design. Conventional by today's standards, honestly for the mid-90s it had a lot of forward-thinking, if not completely unheard of, features. A side folding stock was standard. Had a modular trigger group. HK style there. Used a rotating bolt, multi-lug. Used a short stroke gas piston system. Borrowed and heavily modernized from the AR-18. This would be the same piston used in the HK-416 as you know. It fired 5.56 five, NATO. It took its own proprietary mags, which I'm not going to be able to get out single-handed here right now. Great. They're very similar but not interchangeable with the Swiss STG P90 mags. 30 rounds standard. They also make for export an AR-15 magwell. Had a, at least the rifle version, had an 18.9 inch barrel with HK style flash hider on the usual tines they like. Had a bayonet lug that was modular. No real traditional iron sights. Free floated handguard. Folding bipod, which was also removable. It's an update of the style you saw on the uh, G3. And it had an integrated optic. Now this is the single 
power the single optic on mine, which is a 1.5 with iron sights above and the carry handle. The Germans initially issued the dual optic, which had a three power scope below and a red dot above. It's a unique look, but the reason I don't have one on mine is a few. Um, while it was a you know pretty advanced optic for the 90s, it's very outdated today. Uh, the batteries are hard to get for it, and frankly, it's just heavy. And this gun is pretty darn lightweight, considering the barrel length and everything. Overall length is about 39 inches with stock deployed. And a lot of the measurements on it, are, it depend on what attachments you have. Like this whole top section is held on with screws and a, and a rail. With the dual optic, it's about eight pounds. With the rail or a single optic, it's about seven and a quarter pounds. And with no optic at all, it's about seven pounds. And some of the other versions, for example, of course, they have a G36K with a 12 and a half inch barrel, and they have the G36C with a nine inch. They can get down well into the six pound range. And they've done other versions with different stocks and stuff. You know the deal, rail handguards. So it was a very modular design. It was very ambidextrous friendly. And uh, very straightforward. And uh, quite inexpensive. And so it was a success, at least at the time. Spain would also adopt it and begin license production. And it would replace the SETME L and the remaining SETME Model Cs that had been in service. And HK would continue supplying them to the Bundeswehr throughout the early 21st century and exporting them to quite a few nations. Over 40 nations have used the G36. And a number of police departments in the USA purchased the carbine versions. I think where it gets a lot of acclaim is just how simple it is. You no know, convoluted controls. And it's extremely easy to reconfigure with just an HK tool. Even the barrels come out if you have the proper tools and blocks. You can swap barrels on these in a few minutes. And while they're all in 5.56, there are different barrel lengths. And uh, heavy barrel, light barrel, what have you. And these have been used by <clears throat> German soldiers in Iraq, Afghanistan, and more recent times. Which, of course, gets into the controversy that started around 2000. Well, I mean, heard about it around 2015, but it started way back in 2010. Here's the standard mag pouch. Funnily enough, it's just a single mag pouch with the typical German style, very much like a late P1 holster. This is the cover for the optics. And let's end with her on her bipod. I'm not going to talk about the overheating controversy, really. It's just, it's a thing. I'll just say that HK designed a rifle to the Bundeswehr specs, and the Bundeswehr was happy with it. They designed what they wanted. I mean, HK had tried to tell the Bundeswehr options, and they rejected them. So with this, they just listened and delivered what the customer ordered. So if there were inherent problems with it, it was probably more to do with the customer's design specs than HK. Who doesn't like that? Hmm. Burp. You can do it like that. Forward assist. Of course it has last round to hold open. Very simple design. Very easy to take apart. And it served Germany well and was a good rifle that they could afford in the 1990s. To that end, HK and others have produced over a quarter million of these. I believe they're up over hundred uh, six. Well, I can't talk. Two hundred and sixty thousand. Uh, and uh, with all the talk of it being replaced in military service and trials to replace it, it's still issued as of 2020, and probably will be in service for at least a few more years. And at that, if it is retired by, say, 2025, while well, the prototype was made in 1995, that's a 30-year run, that's pretty respectable. So I'd, I would definitely not consider the G36 a failure. 
As to semi-autos in America, we did receive the highly sporterized SL8 that some gun wizards like Tom Bostic have, are able to turn into a military gun and uh, more recently Bostic has released a pretty much all American G36 clone and also some models built from parts kits and this one here is one of the less common this is one from Mike Ott and uh, Michael's Machines and this is a original gun that was very carefully cut the receiver was cut brought over and then reassembled again by Mr. Bostic his original HK production barrel so it's as good as you're probably gonna find good shooter though a lot of fun and a unique looking gun and it really rounds out the uh, the German collection and we've done a couple of full-length videos so if you'd like to you know discuss more history and features and see it at the range you can uh, you can check that out well there we have it folks we made it from the late 19th century all the way through the 20th we saw Germany fight two world wars and split apart come back together and today is an important member of the European community and uh, coalition ally well let's go back to the couch for a few final thoughts and there you have it essentially rifles issued by the Germans from the 1890s through 2020 so about 130 years plus with these videos I'm tr maybe trying to share with you how my own mind works to me personally it's just very interesting to see product evolution and continuation maybe for you it doesn't matter if not sorry but you know it is what it is but you know it's funny you see a lot of common design elements so obviously they hung on to the Mauser for a very long time then you get to their self loaders they kept a lot of similar systems like the the uh, trigger that the charging handle even when they move on to the MP44 they keep a lot of the same ergonomics and that would continue on it's just really impressive how the MP44 directly influenced the G3, the SEPMI, the AK even the FAL and others the best one you can say there's not a terribly direct connection with although in principle it still influenced it would be something like the M14 the BM-59, but even there the concept was kind of promoted by the MP-44. And then, I know it gets overlooked, at least it has in the past, but the G-36, while it's not a, at least in world terms, a huge step forward, if you look what they had before, the G-3 dated back to the 1950s, the MPI series dated back to the 40s, or at least 50s, if you want to be really generous. So to go from designs from there to a, a truly modern design in the 1990s was a couple of generation jump for them in, in both caliber and capacity. It was one of the first, mostly all polymer, military guns, and one of the first to be ambidextrous, left-hand friendly. One of the first to have an optic, a standard, you know, Styrog kind of really pioneered that but and it also had quick change barrels at least at the armorer level very reliable mags I think it's it's underrated is it perfect no but there's a reason they have hung on to it as long as they have and why Jeremy White HK and others have produced so many just thoughts but yeah I think it's an underlooked gem in my mind it's kind of like if you took a Glock and made it into a rifle I think it would resemble the G36, frankly. Simple, maybe not physically the most attractive, a lot of polymer, but just easy to use and very reliable. So what do you think? What Do you like the old guns, the new guns, 
Do you hate them all? Do you love them all? What about your own? Do you have a G1 or a G3? Have you done an MPI build? Let's talk about them. Comments below. Why not? By the way, the whole reason this video kind of got started was the MPI because people have been I've been doing these collections and people ask things and that's my only German AK so I couldn't do it by itself. So I thought, okay, bring out the G3 <laughs> and then it just balloons from there. Why not? Anyway, hope you had fun throughout these two parts. Please feel free to comment and as always, if you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you really, really would like to help us out, yeah, check out the link. Look at our Patreon page. Donating a buck, five bucks, whatever you can. And if not, just sharing and liking is, is great too. And with that, I hope you're having a, a good one. And we'll be back very soon with hopefully fresh content next time.